Hey. <laughs> Every week he catches me digging in my pockets, <laughs> doing stuff. Uh, that's, that's my brother for you. Who wouldn't trade him for anything? Maybe for Curtis. I don't know. <laughs> well, good morning. Thank you again for joining us this morning in Sunday Fellowship. We are going to get off to a quick start. We have a lot to cover since I'm, uh, I, I need to finish this today because I uh, promised our dear brother Curtis he's going to uh, do the message next week, so I don't want to leave any details. We have a lot of uh, uh, revelation of the mystery when it comes to uh, our understanding of what we're going to talk about this, this week, the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit in the areas that we've learned in, 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 uh, in adoption. We talked about the tripartite man last couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to do a quick, re- quick review of that. We're going to do a quick review of that, and then we'll head into where we're going this week, because I think it's going to take a minute. The, the, uh, <laughs> the serious <laughs> Chris and Melinda, and Chris, Jim, Chris said, do not put the camera on him. Do not put the camera. I don't want that brother not to come back or go over this thing, mess up my room here trying to get to you. <laughs> anyway, we had we had a nice time with with uh, Chris and Melinda this week this weekend. Chris's birthday was this weekend, and so we had a nice time celebrating that last night. Uh, they have been precious in the Father. The Father has them in a place there in Kansas City right now that they have entered into fellowship, and they have been asked to kind of teach the in Christ message. In, in spoon size bits, <laughs> little spoonfuls at a time. But they have been asked to, to lead a, 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 a time of teaching on, I think, Wednesday nights. So um, we, we need to keep, keep them in, in our prayers because, you know, the in Christ message is not something people just, oh, I like this. Every now and then you find one or two of those, but most of the time it faces religion. It faces because everybody wants to co-mingle uh, uh, body and soul identity with spirit soul identity and it, it doesn't work so anyway guys good to have you here with us this weekend uh, pray for them as as they go back to kansas city but anyway my lovely wife will get started we're going to get started uh, if you have prayed good if you haven't prayed we have so that's okay we're good either way if you prayed we're going to receive that if you haven't prayed we have jenny jesus that's the Baptist answer. That's the Baptist answer. I know it wins every time. So let's go, sweetheart, please. Reviewing and rethinking the mind of the flesh versus the mind of the spirit, part two. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Romans 8, 5. Sadly, with all the preaching and teaching in religion, believers and churchgoers still have not heard or don't understand the difference in being born again, not of corruptible seed, and the act of conversion. Far too many live with a double-minded idea of being born again and adoption as the same and necessary for one to be saved. The word adoption is one of the most misunderstood words the Apostle Paul used. In the mind of the flesh, adoption makes room for the box life identity to continue. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but it also makes room for salvation for the flesh. Mm -hmm. Within the mind of the spirit, adoption is the source and foundation for the process of sonship. We've been teaching about union and oneness and identity for years, although in the past several years, we have received new understanding concerning our IOU in Christ. Along with that, the Father also gave us desensitization to the person of Christ. Yet today, many still don't see, hear, know, or begin to understand the spiritual power in those words. That power is waiting to be revealed and released in the Son of God with ears to hear what His Father is saying. He has been saying this since the day we were birthed by Him. These words are corporate to all His sons but they can only be received by those sons who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. The difference is in whether you are listening in the mind of the flesh versus the mind of the Spirit. All identity is not true spiritual identity unless it is your new identity as another person in Christ, the Son. And lastly, 
What about the in Christ position? And how is it affected by desensitization to the person of Christ and sonship? In Christ is one of the most used doctrinal statements in the Bible. Yet it is the most misunderstood and misused statement by religion today. Why is that? The mind of the flesh versus the mind of the spirit. 2 Corinthians 1 and 11, 13, 11 and 3 But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay. That's going on to the quick review part. Quick review from last week. Let's start with our new drawing of the tripartite man from last week's message. Okay. That's good. I'll, I'll, I'll cover that. As, as I've told you before, we have... Uh, 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 the father gave us when we were teaching a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago on oneness, uh, 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 abortion, oneness and sonship, that this description kind of uh, gives us a better idea of the tripartite man. We have bodies, spirit, soul. And as, as I drew on this last week, we have uh, uh, self, which is in part of the soul, soul mind here. But anyway, uh, we call this part over here where the soul and spirit come together. We call that what? The mind of the what? Right, mind of the spirit. And down here where this part now, as you can see our little box or a diagram of the body, the part of the soul mind comes outside. That's where we have our feelings, emotions, what we know as our senses. Our senses pertain to the outer world. There is nothing that your senses pertain. Hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching are all outer things, right? So we have this part of the tripartite man, this part of the uh, uh, soul is in the mind of the what? Right. So, uh, as we said last week, <coughs> uh, this part of the tripartite man or the mind of the flesh is a combination between the soul mind and what the body that's your outer identity or your what well that's your box and, and, but the suitcase is part is the soul where we store it every let me as i said last week everything in third dimension is packaged and taken in by this part of the soul mind it's where most of us understand in the flesh but we put it away back here in the soul. So we put it back here, and that's where it stays. Anything you've learned is stored. Anything you've learned in your flesh is stored here. Anything you learn in your spirit is stored here as well, stored in this portion, the mind of the spirit. But anyway, uh, we talked about the, the, the uh, and I mentioned this to someone I was talking about this last week, about the Trinity. The Trinity. What is the Trinity. Really? Thank you. The word became flesh. So that tells us that the word became flesh. So the word was there before the son in that context. For us, we say the son, the father, son, the Holy Ghost. That's in third dimension. But the, when John 1 and what, 14? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that's when the word took on the body and that's when he became what? The son. That's when it became the sun. Now, with that, over here in my little, Jim did a much better job on the thing than me. We see the, 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 the word here became the sun. I put that up there like that. And what, what happened to the sun? Huh? Right. What happened to him? Right. Went to the cross. And after that, it became what? For us. Salvation. And where does that go? In our spirits. Now, that, that's, kind of a simple, that's kind of a simple way of saying it, simple way of seeing it, that God put Christ in us. How, uh, uh, how many spirits, when God put Christ in us, in the spirit of man, what spirit of man was created to God to do? Yeah, I saw that, Jim. What was the spirit of man created to do? Receive. 
Every part of the tripartite man is created by God to do one thing. Receive. Body, receive. Soul, mind, information, knowledge. And spirit, receive the person of God or the person of Christ, either one. The thing is, where is your identity? Where is our identity? We discussed this last week. Where is identity? Okay, let's take it from there, smarty pants. <laughs> Where everybody in this room has an identity, right? A unique and different identity. Where is it located? Okay. In the box. It's located at every level. Depending on, like Jenny said, third or fourth dimension. Okay, we're getting some, some, some answers here. Good. Every level. Steve, you want to contribute in that? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to contribute in that? <laughs> Sylvia, you want to help the, you want to help your family out? Uh-huh. Jim? Put a slide up, Jim. Curtis? Every level has an identity. Okay. One, one sort or another. Unique identity is what my word was. Yes, every level has a unique identity. Is that true? Okay, oh, wait, do you see how she's really hesitated a bit? Yeah, that's her husband. But, but. <laughs> in the body, our uniqueness is in our DNA, correct? Everybody has on the planet unique identity in the flesh. Except for what, Sylvia? Twins, triplets, quadruples, they all have the same DNA profile. All twins have the same. I was talking about this when I was at breakfast the other morning with someone. And they said, I didn't know that. I said, you didn't know twins have the same DNA profile? I said, no. I said, every, every, every human being on the planet has, has a different and unique DNA profile. That's why they do those DNA tests. But for twins and triplets and quadruplets, they have the same DNA profile. So where, where is their uniqueness? It, with, and that's so mine. That's that the uniquely different in the soul. And so are we, each one of us, are uniquely different. Now, God did that for us. Our uniqueness will always be in our soul mind for the purpose when we get our new bodies and so forth and so on. But and what about spirit? All human spirit is the same. Nobody has a different human spirit. There's no DNA, no difference in human spirit. Now, it could be either have, it could be in union with Christ, but it's still the same. I mean, what I mean is that the, the, the capacity of his identity is still the same. So, but when you put Christ in there, it changes our spiritual identity <coughs> to another person. But our uniqueness in expression for that new spirit is through the soul, through our soul mind. So anyway, Let's go on. Keep going. But what, I, what I meant by that is this, guys. It is the difference between the mind of the spirit and the mind of the flesh. The mind of the spirit and mind of the flesh. Okay. On, on with that discussion, the mind of the flesh needs relationship as basis of identity and security. This relationship idea is why most believe we were created by God so that we can be in relationship with him. Some might even say he wanted us to have an intimate relationship with him. Has God not had a unique relationship with man since the day man was created by him? Yes, he has. So what was missing? It depends on which mind you're using to answer the question. (laughs) The mind of the spirit knows and understands we were created by God for something more dynamic than just relationship. He created man to be related to him spiritually related in a way that no other creature can ever attain. The power of how we are related to him produces an identity which yields this unique type of relationship we live with him. Our relationship is based on this knowledge of union, oneness, and identity spiritually. Yet, it appears the mind of the flesh cannot receive this God idea because it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 2, 6, and 7 But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? 
Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. Okay. Just, uh, uh, put that Hebrews verse in there for what? Anybody know why I put that Hebrew verse in there? Clarification. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's one of the Jesus answers. <laughs> you want to be a little bit more specific. Can you be more specific why I put that verse in there? Well, the preceding paragraph speaking about relationship. <laughs> right. And right. God has never been apart from man. This verse tells us what is meant that thou shalt be mindful of him. That means that that verse literally means that human beings created by God was on his mind before the foundation of the world. And we've never left. We've always been there. We were there before the foundation of the world. Why? Because we were placed in Christ when? Before the foundation. So his mind is always on us. So when people say, well, uh, Adam fell and uh, we were separated from God and uh, Lord have mercy. We need to get, you know, whatever religion tells you. That's not true. We've never been absent from him. So were we created for relationship? No. It's simple as that. We were created to be related to him so he can be related to us. How is he related to us? Curtis? As our father. As father. That's correct. As father, not just as father, as the father, which is a what? Specific. Okay. I can't think of the name of it. You can't? I know it, but I can't think of it right now. Okay. <laughs> Definite article is what yes. you're trying to say. Yes. <laughs> That's Greek, Curtis. Okay. That's Greek, brother. Definite article. That's a Greek term. You, you with me? Okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> what, the, what God has done to, be, to have us related to him is take a part of himself, part of the Godhead, and put it in a human being. That human being is no longer something he created, but some, something he's what? Birth. Thank you, Chris. Catch that? That brother's not afraid to sit here up front. <laughs> birth, birth by him so that we could be related to him. And in that, in how we're related to him gives us an identity as what? The son or sons. That determines relationship. That determines. Human beings, we have a, we have a, we have a temptation to want to make relationship the issue, because we get something out of that. Or at least we think we do. Curtis, I used this last week, Curtis is married to Jenny. He's, 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 relate, he, 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 he's related to Jenny. But he's related to Catherine and uh, Malinda and Sylvia. What's the difference? The difference is the type of relationship that comes out of how he's related to them. So, one is in the mind of the flesh and the other is in the mind of the spirit. Keep going, honey. Okay, the need to wrap our minds around. In the mind of the flesh, we have an, uh, an insatiable need to know and understand everything mm. because the mind of the flesh was created to receive. Because of this, we will always have a need to possess some form of knowledge to be fulfilled. The problem with the mind of the flesh is that it cannot comprehend spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. In the mind of the Spirit, we have a need to give and live love. The human spirit was created to receive the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ the Son. This event completes and fulfills the human spirit. This is a completely new spirit in the human. These two spirits become one new spirit known by God the Father as the Son of God to him. God has had others he has called son. This is how we are related to God. The, humans, the human is no longer the same creation as before he or she is a new species, the Son of God. Of course, the mind of the flesh cannot wrap itself around this God idea. That's why so many struggle with 
who, learning who they are in Christ. Jenny? Because who we are in Christ is spiritual. You cannot wrap your mind around that. The, 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 the mind of the flesh cannot, com- Paul said what? It cannot comprehend that. Mm-hmm. It cannot receive that. And you will never be able to walk in that in who you are biologically, physiologically, <laughs> or uh, in, in your outer identity. So it cannot comprehend. Will you read that verse, please? 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 11. But as it is written, I hath not seen, ear ha- uh, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of, my, ma- of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Which means what? If you're in your flesh, which Paul gets to in verse 14. You, you can't receive it. You can't. You cannot understand it because it said it comes from God by the spirit. And that's the only way you're going to know it. It is by the the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. Keep going, baby. Reviewing and rethinking being born again and conversion or converted in the mind of the flesh. Salvation is an idea of being born again plus conversion. This combination makes a provision for the flesh to continue as the same person with Jesus added to a new belief. The cross within the conversion is being born again idea is being born again is being born again idea is a place where Jesus died for me. This is not bad or wrong. It's just the illusion of explanatory depth. The term conversion is religious, outer for salvation. It is not spiritual. Definition of salvation by a work of the Holy Spirit, placing the spirit or person of Christ in the receiving and believing, non-believing sinner. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and read that one verse. Matthew's eight, Matthew 18 and 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So we're talking about the definition of conversion. conversion. Oh, converted. To turn, turn around, to turn one's <laughs> self from one's course of conduct to change one's mind. Okay, let's pause with that before you get to the mind of the spirit. <clears throat> what does that say about converted? The word converted means what? Yeah. To turn around, change your mind. Now, verse 18, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 3, Jesus said, except you be converted, right? And become as little children. How do you do that? He said, as become as little children, not like. And that's one thing religion does. They take that word and be, you need to be like little children. You need, to, you need to have childlike faith. How many times have you heard that? You heard that, haven't you? You need to have childlike faith. Some of you guys, oh, some of you guys that are listening, uh, you, they, you hear have childlike faith. But that's not what Jesus said. He told them something, one, that they did not understand. Now, let me say it differently. They knew what the word converted meant. Because in, 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 in Israel at that time, who was converted? Gentiles. The Gentiles. Jews were not converted. They didn't have to. They were already Jews, right? So when Jesus said, unless you are converted, that didn't make sense because they're already Jews. That's why John the Baptist got in so much trouble. He was out there baptizing Jews. He was baptized. You didn't, Jews didn't need to be baptized. Gentiles were baptized when they converted into Judaism to become, uh, to, 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 to believe on the God of Israel. So they did not need conversion. But Jesus said they did. And on top of it, he said they need to become as little children. Now, when he said to Nicodemus, what did he say to Nicodemus, Curtis? Unless you're born again. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, Right? Offended him, he confused him. He didn't. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm a little bit big to go back in my mama's womb. Didn't make sense because Jesus is saying something here that has nothing to do with the idea of turning around and changing or making provision for the flesh. Because you can't become as a little child. 
So that's the same ideas at work. Okay, read on, baby. The mind of the Spirit, in the mind of the Spirit, salvation is union of the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of man, as Paul tells us in two epistles. Romans 8 and 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. How many spirits is that, Curtis? One. How many? How many spirits is that, Jenny? One. So that means two, the spirit of man and the spirit of Christ have now become their union that has bring, brought them into what? Oneness. One new spirit makes us what? One new person. One new creation. Matter of fact, we literally become, this is where it gets, this is where it gets ugly. We literally become another person. God did not birth you as another person to be a Baptist, Jeannie. <laughs> God did not birth you to be another person, a, to be a, a, a Methodist, Catherine. Or was that Episcopal? Methodist. Methodist. Sylvia, Presbyterian, C Curtis, uh, Bible Church is what, what, what it was, Bible Church, yeah. And, and you came out of Baptist too, didn't you? Yeah. He strongly considered Wesleyans. He, con he considered the Wesleyan, but he said, nah, ain't going to do it. Put him to the cross. <laughs> Take him to the cross. So the relevance in that identity is not third dimensional. You've heard me say it before, God didn't put Christ in you, make you another person to misuse that in becoming a, 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 a Democrat or a Republican or, or an independent. Hey, I'm independent. I don't go be one of them. Yeah, yeah. No, there is no such thing. That's a human idea. Just like being a Baptist is a human idea or, or assembly of God, a church of God, a church of God in Christ or any of those things. Why? Because it denies that if any man be in Christ, he is a, another person. Another person. So when the two, when the spirit of man and spirit of God become one, this is not the spirit of man anymore. <laughs> Do you follow that? It's, it's not the spirit of man anymore. It is not the spirit of Christ anymore. What is it? Son. The son. Get that. Unless you realize that when God puts Christ in you, you become someone, you're going to be stuck in union. For the rest of your life, there's going to be you and Jesus. Did I say that correctly, Curtis? Yes, sir. Okay. Jenny, did I say that correctly? Let me, in case I was talking in tongues, let me say it again. You need interpretation. Unless you become another person by God putting Christ in you, and that person is not the Son of God, you still dealing with you and Jesus. And you will live in your flesh, struggling week after week, month after month, year after year. Now, I'm not saying you're not born again. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying you're not born again. The problem is you don't understand what born again means. Chris reminded me of something. We were talking the other night, and Chris reminded me of something when I first started going teaching at the I was teaching at this large, large denominational church, five, 6,000 people, and my first day in class teaching, one of the first things I said, I stood up before that group, about 50, 55, 60 people, I said, what you see is a six foot five black male. That's not what I see. I see the Son of God standing here in this six foot five black body. This is what I'm using to, 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 this is what I'm using to be about my father's business, but it's not who I am. Because I'm another person living inside a body that my biological parents gave me, which makes me, in this case, the son of man. Let, let me tone it down. Let me, let me tone it down. This makes me the son of a man. How about that? <laughs> this makes me the son of a man. How about that? that that's it. I'm the son of God. But in the body I was given biologically, I'm, the, I'm a product of, of I'm a son 
of the parents that birthed me. How about that? That's toning it out even more. If I get it any lower than that, it's going to lose its meaning. <laughs> but anyway, so that's what we mean when we're talking about these verses that Catherine just read. Now let's go one more, Catherine, please. And Jesus said, John 3, 6 through 8, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And yes. That, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Yes. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but can't, cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Mm. Keep going. In the mind of the Spirit there is no Christ plus anything, not even adoption. Even though adoption uh, is, written in the bi- um, is written in the Bible, most of us understand is usually compared to physical adoption. And although there are similar parallels, they're not identical. In the mind of the Spirit, adoption is a part of the mystery and must be revealed by, by the Father for his purpose, intent, and plan of adoption. Now, let's take a look at adoption and its beginning in the Bible. Now, let me, let me, Paul, let, just let me throw something in there before you continue to read this, because I really want to get into two parts of this thing on adoption. Um, the sad thing is people read that five times the word adoption is used in the New Testament. Five times. Curtis, you remember where they are? You don't have to repeat them, brother. I, I got it right here in case you... Two Say what now? Two Romans, That's very good. Do you hear that, brother? Say He's almost... He's, he's, he's moving on. Three in Romans, one Galatians, one in Ephesians. That's okay. Room for error. Room for error. That's grace, okay? <laughs> I had a brother write me from Belgium the other day and say, he said, yeah, I couldn't get used to you laugh. He said, I couldn't get used to the, when you laugh all the time. I said, well, I laugh because I'm having fun with what I do. <laughs> so I don't know if he still watches or not, but brother, I'm going to smile. <laughs> Laughter is a medicine. Most of us need a lot of medicine. But anyway, that's five times Paul used that statement. And because Paul used it, listen to me very carefully. Because Paul used it, you have, to, you, have to, you have to receive the idea that everything Paul said to us had some reference to the mystery. So what Paul said to us when he wrote all had to be based in the revelation of the mystery. And we don't, we don't, we don't do that because we read from the understanding of what? The flesh. Academic and intellect. Or intellectual or academic. So when we're reading the word adoption, it need, we need to make it fit. Remember, I told you the, the mind has an insatiable need to, uh, to know and understand. So we just take it as, oh, yeah, that's adoption. Yeah, I know what that means. I got, well, he means this. If you don't have and have a basis for what this brother is saying from his understanding of the mystery, we will always miss what he's telling us in Christ. We'll always miss it because it's not academic and intellectual. The root of what he says to us is always spiritual because it was given to him spiritually. You follow me? So is that wrong? Well, it it makes your knowledge incomplete. How about that? It makes your knowledge incomplete of who you are. So go ahead, Catherine, please. Israel as an adopted people. Individuals are taken into human families the Old Testament refers to Israel as having been brought into God's family. In the Hebrew scripture, Israel is referred to as the son of God. Um, Hosea. Hosea 11, 1. By election and adoption, Deuteronomy 14 and 2. In referring to this, we find the use of verba solemnia. That's just, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, go ahead. Terminology that is reminiscent of ancient Near East adoption tablets. Um, Exodus 6 7, I will take you for my people and I will be your God. That's an adoption statement. Okay? That's what that's saying. It is an adoption statement. God is showing us in this case that He's taking a He's adopting a whole people. Right? Mm-hmm. Not just one person, a whole people. Keep that in mind. And and, and, and remember this. What people is he talking to? Israel, right, my Linda? So what about all the rest of those people? They're not part of the adoption. 
Say it again. They are not part, part of, of the, the adoption. adoption. Okay? Correct. Did you, did you guys get that? Did you get that? They are not part of the adoption. Israel is, I mean, everybody else outside Israel is not part of the adoption. Keep that in mind. You're gonna, there's going to be a, there's going to be a pop quiz. Keep going, please. Leviticus 26, 12 and Jeremiah 7, 23. And I will be your God and you will be my people. There it is again. Who is he talking about? Israel. Okay. Pop quiz. That was good. And then three scriptures saying this same, this same thing. And you will be my people and I will be your God. Jeremiah 11, 4, 30, 22. You don't have to go through all of them. Israel is declared the son of God by adoption. Exodus 4, 22 through 23. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son. Say it again. Israel is my son. That means the whole bunch. Even my firstborn. Uh-oh. Now, did he say birth Israel? No. No. That means the firstborn born as a people, right? Mm -hmm. It's Israel. Okay. Uh, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay my, thy son, even thy firstborn. Okay. Keep going. Adoption in the Old Testament. There are three relatively clear references to human adoption in Hebrew scriptures. Exodus 2.10, Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, receiving all the rights, privileges, and duties of a biological son. Even educated as a prince. Now, we all know this, right? Everybody knows that Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, correct? Okay. Yes. First Kings 11 and 20, Jenubath was brought up by the queen and was said to be among the sons of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Esther 2, 7, 15, Esther was adopted by her uncle Mordecai after her parents died. Now, do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Keep going. There are some additional texts that seem to hint at adoption. Genesis 16, 2. Sarah gives her husband her female slave so that it may be that I shall obtain children by her. This seems to indicate the possibility of Sarah adopting these children and regarding them as her own. Now, now for, that, for that scenario, there was only one child born by Abraham or Abram and Hagar, right? Mm -hmm. So biologically, it would be Abraham's child. It was. But Sarah had to what? Adopt. Adopt. Okay, keep going. Judges 11, 1 and 2. Jephthah is described as being the son of Gilead and a harlot who was driven out of his hometown by his half-brothers so as to deny his inheritance. To gain an inheritance, his father would have needed to adopt him. Okay, keep going. First adopted son of God, Luke 3 and 38, which was the son of Enos. E which yes. Enos, Go Enos ahead. which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So who's the first God? Who's the first son of God? Son of God. Adam. Who's the first son of God? Adam. Adam. How did he get that be? How did he get that way? He made him and claimed him. He adopted him. He took him on as his. OK, keep going. Adoption is the process of sonship. Uh, now, you don't have to just read the. The addresses, but you don't have to read the, 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 all those three Roman texts because I want to look at these other two. Keep okay. going. Okay, Romans 8, 15, 8, 23, 9, and 4. Mm -hmm. Galatians 4 and 5, Ephesians 1 and 5. Adoption of miserable street urchins. Now, <laughs> the adoption of miserable street, you know what a street urchin is? I won't even explain what a street urchin is. It's going to take too much time. But I want to, what I'm about, what, what we're about to hear and what we're about to see is that most people in church, if you've been going to a good church, a good Baptist church has this idea, uh, a good Pentecostal church has this idea, a lot of in religion have this idea about adoption. So I want you to read this, this context here, and I've got the part I really want you to look at underlined. Shall I begin with Ephesians 1 and 5? Yeah, go ahead. Having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Here's a common idea of adoption in religion. The word predestined does not imply impersonal, deterministic fate. It means to mark out or decide beforehand and refers to God's plan for the ages. It is reasonable that an all-wise God 
had a plan in mind before he created the universe. Being God, he has the inherent ability to carry out his plans. Part of his plan to glorify himself was to reach down to the gutters of sin. That part, now, whoa. To did the gutters of sin. Did you catch that? Part of his plan was to reach down. Which means something happened that he had to go and correct. Did you catch that? Part of God's plan. His plan included him reaching down. That, that really nullifies a couple of good verses that the lamb was slain when? Before the foundation. We were chosen in Christ when? Before. But the common idea is we have to make provision for the flesh, and that's what you're seeing here. K keep reading, sweetheart. Reach down to the gutters of sin and adopt certain miserable street urchins to be his sons. Certain miserable street urchins. <laughs> That's the common idea of, of, of religion, that we're all miserable worms, worthless. worthless, unwanted. Why? Because of sin. That's what I mean. If you're going to read Paul, you need to start where you started. Paul's the only writer in the New Testament that says something about before the foundation of the world. Now, well, he's not the only. Peter said the, 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 the lamb slain when before the foundation of the world. So sin was taken care of before we were even there to sin. So here we're saying, this, this, this author of this, this text is saying, God reached down and, 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 and did what? Adopted certain miserable street urchins. Not all of them, just certain ones. Keep reading, babe. There was nothing attractive or desirable about us that prompted oh. God to adopt us into his family. To the contrary, we were repulsive to God because of our sin. See, so but far, his great, I can't, I can't, his great can't love took pity on us and snatched us <sighs> out of the government. Where did you quote this from? Or is it just somebody's writing? It's somebody's writing. I didn't quote it. And none of that's mine. He cleaned us up, clothed us with his righteousness, and brought us to his uh, house and banquet table where we enjoy every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, he, he, just, he just whizzed through. He just whizzed through. What he said about God's plan. He whizzed through, and not, plus he co-mingled that with Israel to the banquet table and all of those kinds. That's not, the, that's not the body. That's not, a, that's not who we are. And none, none of that has to do with us. Who does that have to do with? Israel. Israel. Thank you. My Linda, you, you're doing pretty good so far. You, you're just stepping right on in there. See? <laughs> it probably was. It probably was. Okay, keep going, baby. <clears throat> the birthing and adoption are both declared before the foundation of the world and creation. The cross is, cross is the source of salvation while the resurrection is the foundation. You didn't read that right. Uh, yeah. Of adoption. Say it again. Adoption. The, the cross is the source of adoption. Stop. Why? Why is the cross the source of adoption? Why is the cross the source of adoption? What is adoption? We read in the Old Testament. What did God say? Mm -hmm. Be your God. So what does the cross have to do with adoption? Jesus had died on the cross before we could be his people. Close. <laughs> close. Very, very close. <clears throat> what happened at the cross? I didn't talk about resurrection. Just the cross. What happened at the cross? Huh? Sin was done away with. Okay, we, well, I, I'll give you sin done away with. That's good. Yes. What else? Death. Death to have life. Okay, death to have life. Anybody else? Uh, 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 Chris, you want to step in there? <coughs> He's not going to mess with it. Steve? Mm -hmm. He died in the cross. Say what? They created union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I, I'll go with you on that because I understand where you're coming from. Let me make it simple. 2 Corinthians 5, 5.15 says what? When one died, oh. how many? Oh. How many? Oh. That's adoption. God killed everybody out so nothing would stand in the way of us having an opportunity to be related to him. When one died, all died. Right? So that they who died were not living to themselves but unto him who died and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, now know we no man after the flesh. So when Christ, at Galatians 2 20, I am crucified with Christ. Yes. 
So what does the cross have to do with adoption? That's how God made everybody his with the opportunity to come to him apart from them individually and what they did in their bodies, all, their bodies all together. So when one died, what? Now, let me, let me read. Uh, Catherine, would you skip down and read 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19? And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. Stop. What does that say? All things are of God. Who Keep has going. reconciled his, us to himself. himself. What did you have to do with that? Nothing. Where does that put you? Where does that put us? We had nothing to do with it. It said all things of God who reconciled us to himself. He brought us to himself. What is it called? Adoption. There's no genetics, no spiritual relationship. There's no spiritually related. But we are brought to a place to him that we can now have access to receive him the cross gave us adoption and brought us to a place where nothing would separate you if you wanted to no sin no misconduct none of that that you could actually receive christ and become the son you follow read, read the last little part please reconcile us to himself by, by Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. That's good. Done, done. And of course, the next part of that says, uh, that, 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 uh, we'll get to that verse. Keep, go, go back up to where you're reading. Up, uh. Okay. The, the cross is the source of adoption, while the resurrection is the foundation for the birthing. Because unless he rose again, we would not have the, what? We would have access to the spirit of Christ or the person of Christ so that we could be born again. Resurrection yes, well. Provides oneness. Maybe, Curtis. <coughs> Resurrection is the foundation for the birthing. The birthing is our union. Our oneness, yes. I, I, it depends how you want to see that, brother. I can understand where you're coming from, seeing that you're back over there behind the thing. <laughs> Paul gave us this message based, based on the revelation of the mystery revealed to him by Christ. So when Paul starts talking about the adoption, his understanding of adoption it doesn't necessarily mean it's not rooted in something that went on in his day. But he understood some things about adoption that we didn't get. We don't get academically. You just can't pick up your Bible and say, yeah, right there, adoption. And we think what it means to us as a legal act. Was that a legal act that God adopted us to himself by the cross? It wasn't legal. It was factual. It was heiress tense. Okay, keep going, sweet. Predestinated. To limit in advance predetermine, determine before, ordain, predestinate, to mark out or, or bound, horizon to appoint, decree, specify, declare, determine, limit, ordain. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who, Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Now, now think about that. He has what? Predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. 2 Corinthians 5 says what? All things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's not born again. That's not salvation. That's access. Keep, keep going. According to the, uh, to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted Except in the, the beloved. beloved. That's a powerful verse. I, I wish I had time. That, that verse alone is a, good, is a good teaching in itself, that we are accepted. What did you have to do with that? Nothing. Who has something to do with that? Both, the Father and the Son. 
God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Here's what that's, that's saying too. Because of Christ, we are accepted. What do you mean accepted? God doesn't see us apart from Christ's work on the cross, which now means every human being has access to God that they didn't have before. You don't work for that. You were given that. Now, whether you utilize it or not is up to you. So adoption in this verse literally means we have a place. There's a place that God prepared for us to come to him to receive something from him. The cross provided that place for us to come to God. And it says, and, and Catherine read this, according to. What did I tell you last week according means? You start from here and you go somewhere with it. According to what? His good pleasure. His will. The praise of his glory. Of his grace. Wherein we are made accepted. That's not a born again believer. That's, that's human beings. Okay. Don't read the thing. Don't read that. Let's skip on down to the next one. Uh, uh, now let's look at adoption in the light of the birthing and maturing into sonship. Galatians 4, 5, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Uh, Galatians 4, 1 through 6, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem that, to redeem, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying of a father. Okay. Since my time is somewhat limited, I, I pluck out these first. Jim, you want to bring that up? I want to show uh, the next page of the notes. We're going to pluck out this, these, these verses, this, this, uh, this idea here from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. And I wrote the words down so that if you want to go back later on and write something in this, you can. Uh, child, this verse says in verse 1, an heir. What is an heir? What does it mean to be an heir? Someone that's entitled to an inheritance. Also, in this context, Paul is saying an heir as long as he's a child. Which literally means two things. One, someone that's born into the family. And two, who is immature. Now, most of us being born again, if we don't know who we are as another person, we are immature. We still are trapped in the two-person gospel as our dear brother Curtis has given us in many months ago. The two-person gospel is what? Me and Jesus. Jesus lives in me. Praise the Lord. That's good. So what does that do for you? Well, that gives me life. That means I'm going to heaven. The me in that is who you are biologically in your flesh. That you all, you're stuck there. That's the two people. That's me and, anytime you see in me and Jesus, you're stuck. You're stuck. You never live anything outside of you plus Jesus. So a, an heir, as long as he's a child, differ nothing from a servant. That word servant in that verse doesn't necessarily mean slave. We discussed that a few weeks ago. It also could mean indentured servant. It could mean somebody who was destitute and, 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 and a master paid off that debt and they're working for him. But in this case, the servant is someone that works for the father. However they got there, usually it's financial. Usually it's financial. But however they got there, it says an heir, someone who has a right to the family business, someone who has a right to the family inheritance, someone who has a right to whatever it takes the father has as his business to take over that business one day. As long as his child differs nothing from a servant. In other words, as long as you're immature, you're no different than anybody else in the world. Even though you got Christ in you, Jenny. There's no different than a whirling. There's no different than somebody who goes to church. People have been in church all their lives. I know people, I've known people who said, who said to me personally, oh, I've been in church all my life. My answer to that person, more than one time, one of them got upset, the other one just looked at me. I said, what's it got to do with Christ living in you? And they just kind of deer in the headlights like, hmm, what do you mean? When is that time in your life that you've been born again, that God put Christ in you? 
There is no such thing as, as Curtis would say, God don't have grandkids. You can grow up in the religion, but that don't mean you're a new creation. An heir, as long as it's, as long as it's child, different enough from a servant, though he be lord of all, is under tutors. Now, this word tutors and governors is a big word. But because the word tutors and governors means you're under what, Jenny? Situation and circumstances. Nobody likes that word. Curtis don't like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're under the CNS game. Nobody likes CNS game. Nobody wants to see in this game. <laughs> Why? Because <clears throat> it hurts. Confused. Tears. Crying. Weeping. Complaining. Moaning. That's true, but we'll get to that in a minute. Because the law that we're talking about here is not the law of Moses. Not the law of Moses. So it's under tutors and governors. Then what does that mean? It says, who under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father. What does that mean? That means the father has placed the word tutors and governors means managers, teachers, stewards, someone that the father has placed in a place to say, look, my son over there, Curtis, mentor. mentor. No, 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 no. That's different. Uh, my son over there is, 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 is immature. And if he's going to take over the, the family business, if he's going to take over the, the, the precious things of the kingdom, uh, he needs to learn who he is in this family. So I want you to go there and I want you to teach him what it means to be a part of the family. Do whatever it takes to get him that way. Now, listen, the tutor and the governor is working for the father. And this is real people here. These are uh, managers, stewards, people that handle households. That's what that means in, in, in governors. But they are working for the father, and they're doing his business. The son is under their control. This is called the process of what? Sonship. This is called the process of sonship. So, you being taught by everything you do every day to be a maturing son that you can one day step up and say, and matter of fact, it's really not what you say. You know why? It's really not what you say. You say, I, I got this being the son of God stuff. Praise the Lord. I, I laid hands and read, 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 healed the sick and cast out devils. No. Who determines that? Kind of. Who determines that? Curtis, who determines that? Your maturity. Who determines that, my lady, since you've been hitting 100? Uh-oh. Who determines that? Your maturity? That's right. Somebody. Who is it? It's a process. You can't it is a process, but somebody determines that in that process. Well, you yourself. No, you don't. You're Thank you. The tutors and the governors. So the and when the tutors and governors work, when the, when, the, when, the, when the father comes back to the tutor and governor and say, how's he doing? Well, this, I had trouble with him this week. I gave him something. He was just wandering and crying, crying, crying to let it, let, let, just, uh, I had enough. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired of being this way, and I'm tired of being that way. And I'm, 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 I'm. And the father said, Okay, I see he's not ready. You think he's ready? No, that, no, 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 Father, he's, he's not ready yet. You're talking in the flesh. You're talking in the flesh situation. It could, yeah, well, in this case, I'm using the flesh to, to pair out a spiritual thing right. because that works the same way in the spirit. It's, 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 it's someone physical, but it's also the same identical thing happening for us where? In the spirit. Doesn't change. But I'm using this because Paul used it that way. So he said, we're under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father. But the father's not going to pull us from under the tutors and governors until the tutor and governor says, hey, you know what? I gave him this last week and that boy just really showed out. I mean, you, father, you'd be real pleased with him. You think he's ready? Yes, sir. Okay, then turn him over. The appointed time of the father is not him saying, okay, 
on de on December the 31st, he's going to quit. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, that's not what he's saying. The tutors and governors determine that. And the father looks at those tutors and governors and says, uh, my Linda, did, did she do all right? Yes, sir, daddy, she sure did. You think he's ready to work in the business? You think he's ready to, be, to take on his share of the family business? Uh, I think he is, dad. That's the appointed time. When the father and the tutors and governors agree, the father says, that's it. Bring him on out. Because Paul says in the next verse, and when we were children, we were under, what does that say? Even so, when we were children, we're in what? Bondage under the elements of what? Third dimension. Where, what part are you is in third dimension? The part where you, <laughs> the part, bodies, body, soul, identity is where that is under, you're under the bondage of the elements of the world. When you move in the spirit, soul, identity, that's what tutors and governors do, or what we call the CNS gang. When that happens, then we move. We begin to move away from the two-person gospel into the oneness of sonship. The process of sonship brings us into sonship, maturity. And that now, understand me, that's progressive. That's ongoing. So there'll be a place where you reach a level of maturity. It's like one, for so many years, you're in elementary school. Next, what? Next phase, you're in middle school. After that, you're in high school. After that, you go to college. So there are levels of maturing but your education doesn't stop because you leave elementary school and go to middle school. So that's how we are here. Okay. Uh, we're under one of the elements and bondage of the world. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. That fullness of time is when we reach that level of maturity that has satisfied him with the tutors and governors that we're in. For the believer, for us as sons, the CNS gang brings us to a place where we can go to Father and say, Father, I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. Chris and I had a conversation the other night. He gave me something. He said the Father said to him, I said, you sure you, sure you gave that to you? He said, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm more certain about that than I am anything else. I said, well, brother, when stuff starts happening, then you need, to, you, need to, you need to acknowledge that, Father, uh, this hurts. But I trust you because you placed me here. Curtis, you placed me here. And because you placed me here, I'm going to trust you. I don't understand why I'm hurting like this. I don't understand all the stuff. To go, but that's in my flesh. When you start having those words, you're moving from elementary school or kindergarten into another level of knowledge and understanding. When, they, when you hit that kind of thought, when that's, when that's part of your thinking, that's part of the mind of Christ. And that, that, that part of the mind of Christ is now the mind of the son. Remember, when you start saying the mind of Christ and my mind, you're still doing what? The mind of the Christ must become the mind of the son that you are. Without it, you're going to struggle in your flesh. So it says here. Uh, under the, uh, 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 but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now, Paul in this, 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 this text, when he says made under the law, there's two laws that we're dealing with. What law is he dealing with? What two laws am I referring to? The Old Testament. Okay, the Old Testament. Law. What's the other one? Sin and, death. sin and death. The law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. If you eat of this fruit, you shall surely. Yeah. So that, 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 yeah, the law of sin and death. Thou shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for the day thou shall eat of it. The law and death. Now, that's not, Mo, that's not the law of Moses that we all, that we all get twisted with. Anyway. To redeem them that was in the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. Now, what does that mean? That they might receive the adoption of sons. What is that? 
Come on, tell me quickly. That they might receive the adoption of son. What is that? Steve, you want to help out? You want to help a brother out? You want to help a brother out? You don't, you don't, you don't know, huh? Yes. That's good, Sylvia. He said to redeem them that were in law that we might receive the adoption of sons. That we might, that we might come to a place in this case of sonship. Our identity and maturity of who we are as sons. Why? And because you are sons, from verse 1, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out before they're not, they're not, that's not being born again. That's having who you are being acknowledged. Abba Father. Abba Father. What does that mean, Abba Father? My Father. You, Daddy, you know who you are as the Son of God. You know who you are. You're not struggling with that anymore. Flip over for me there, Catherine. Read the verse in Acts. Acts 22, 26 through 28, when the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, take heed what thou, what thou, uh, what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, yeah. And the chief captain, yeah, <laughs> yay. <laughs> and the chief captain answered, with a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, but I was free born. Now let me boil that down for you right quick. What happened, you know, Paul was taken prisoner, right? And he was chained up. They put him in, they put him in jail. Uh, the, uh, the centurion and the chief, uh, chief captain. But they found out Paul was a Roman. And under Roman law, you could not do that to a Roman citizen. Couldn't do it to a Roman citizen. You just couldn't, you, you just couldn't do what they were doing to him. So that's why he said, you know, you need to take heed. This man is a Roman. They knew what that meant. You see how he hurried, he hurried up and got back to the Paul? Because that could cost him his life. So what happened? He said, he went to him now. You have to understand. He says, tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, yay. In other words, Paul said, yes, I am. And so <laughs> the captain said, so with what great sum, with what great sum did you gain your freedom? Now, as a Roman citizen, you could become a Roman citizen by three ways. Curtis, you remember what they are? Being bought. Bought. You can, you can purchase your citizenship. So he, say, he said, well, uh, he wasn't serving in the military. He knew that. But he said, you must have purchased your freedom because nobody could be a Roman citizen unless they were. So Paul said he was born that way. He was born free. Hmm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Paul's father, who was a Pharisee, who was a Jew, bought his personal freedom. That made his children what? Free. Free. Roman. They were born free. So that, that I, I wanted to use that to give you an idea about adoption. The first part of that, it could have been adoption that Paul had his, had his freedom. He could have been adopted. But it wasn't. He was born into that. And because he was born into, that, in, into, his, in, in, into Roman citizenship, he was free from all the things that other people who had to do to get there. So anyway, I have a little here on the mind of Christ, but since I've already discussed the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ and the mind of the son, and, and the mind of the son. I won't go over that. I've gone over a little bit. Really didn't want to do that, but that's okay. I can I can live with that. Uh, I want to thank you guys for for joining us this week in Sunday Fellowship. I had a lot of stuff to cover today. I reviewed a little bit more than I thought I was going to review, only because of Chris and my Linda. It's 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 them. I would have finished forty five minutes ago if they wouldn't have been here. <laughs> That's not true. You're right, baby. That's not true. 45 minutes of this was repetitive. <laughs> <laughs> For us. Yes. So anyway, I want to thank you guys for joining us this week in Sunday Fellowship. We are, 
uh, got a treat for you guys next week. Our dear brother Curtis is going to bring something that the father gave him. Uh, he always has something that he, he that turns him upside down and hopefully turn you upside down as well. Uh, I try to not let it turn me upside down because then I have to come back and clean it up. <laughs> Yeah, right, right to ship. <laughs> We're heading to the rocks. Turn, turn, turn. <laughs> but anyway, I enjoy having you guys here. We had some great, we had some great emails this week. Thank you uh, for the emails we've got this week. We got some emails on song of the day. I had three people email me this week on song of the day that they ministered to them when they heard it. And one, two people said, to me, "Man, I really enjoy." I mean, different days. I really need to hear this song today. I really need to hear this song. Chris told me there's one by Laura Dingle. You say. Say you. Say you. You say. You say. Yes, you say. Laura and Dingle. What did I say? Dingle. Dingle? Okay. <laughs> anyway, once again, appreciate you guys. Trust to see you next week. Curtis, see Curtis next week. He's going to look like this. Six foot five. <laughs> he won't. Five foot nine white boy, he says. <laughs> In the flesh. <laughs> but apart from that, I am the son of God living in this body called David. He's the son of God living in that body called Don Curtis. In either case, the father wants to say something to us all. Amen? All right. God bless you. See you guys next week.